Hello Biology 400 students, this is Mr. Gales and I'm bringing you Central Dogma screencast session number five. The focus of this screencast is translation. The learning targets for translation can be found on page 69 in your unit packet and there are some related web links and activities that are listed here that might help you with your understanding of this process. Also the textbook reference for translation can be found in section 9.5, that's pages 247 to 251. So let's go ahead and begin by describing what translation is overall. And when you think about translation, you probably usually think about taking maybe a sentence in English and writing it out in a foreign language like Spanish, German, or French. Translation in terms of biology is similar. We're taking the language of nucleic acids, we're going to translate it into the language of proteins. Translation is one of the steps of the central dogma, and if you take a look at the picture that you see here, this goes through the, the different aspects of the central dogma of molecular biology. Central dogma essentially states that genetic information flows from DNA to RNA and eventually to protein. And we've learned all about DNA structure and how DNA replicates, and you've learned about how DNA is transcribed into RNA, and in this screencast we're going to focus on the steps of translation that are necessary to convert or to translate the genetic message into a protein. Now, go back to that analogy of translating within languages. Remember that nucleic acids have a four-letter language. Those four letters that make up the alphabet of nucleic acids are the four bases, thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. And recall that thymine is replaced by uracil in RNA. So the nucleic acids have this fairly brief um, alphabet, but it's able to encode quite a bit of information because of the way that we arrange those letters. When translation occurs, we're translating from a four-letter language into the language of proteins, which has a 20-letter language. And those 20 letters that make up the protein alphabet are the 20 different amino acids that are, uh, make up all proteins. Now, in order to be able to understand translation and how translation happens, you have to understand the genetic code. Here you see a picture of the genetic code. Uh, essentially is uh, composed of several what we call codons. Codons are three base sequences of messenger RNA and each one of those codons specifies or codes for a particular amino acid. Now when this was first being worked out in the late 50s and early 1960s it was discovered that if you were going to code for 20 different amino acids and you had four different bases that would do that that you would have to have three bases in a row that would code and the thinking there is if you have the four bases and you arrange them only in groups of one, so four bases taken one way, that would be four to the power of one or only four different amino acids that would be coded for. If you had two bases that coded for a single amino acid, you could arrange those four bases taken two different ways, so that would be four squared or 16 amino acids that would be coded for. That obviously didn't work either. We have 20 different amino acids. So what scientists figured out was that there had to be groups of three bases. If you have four bases taken three ways, that's four to the power of three, and that codes for 64 different amino acids. Now there's only 20 different amino acids, so what this means is that there will be several codons that code for the same amino acid. And we take a look here at the genetic code table, the codon UAA, UUG, CUU, CUC, CUA, and CUG all code for the same amino acid leucine. This is referred to as a redundant or degenerate genetic code. And what that means is that there will be more than one codon for most amino acids, and this in some ways helps to protect against the effect of mutation. When you read the genetic code, you look at the first base in the codon that's found here along the left-hand side, the second base is located across the top, and then the third base of the codon is along the right-hand side. So if your codon is CCU, you look for the first base C, you look at the second base C, and you bring them together, and then the third base is U, and there you can see that that codes for the amino acid proline. So the genetic code informs us how the genetic message is trans translated into the amino acid sequence. Now to understand the process of translation, there are four different players that are important in terms of their role for translation. Um, the first one is messenger RNA. We've talked about messenger RNA as part of the process of transcription, but we're going to review its structure and its purpose here. Ribosomes, the location where translation occurs. Transfer RNA, which plays an important role in carrying amino acids. And finally, amino acids themselves, the building blocks of proteins. 
So let's start by looking at messenger RNA. Messenger RNA, as you remember, is synthesized during transcription, and it's composed of what we call codons. Codons are three base sequences of mRNA. So on this picture, what you'll see is this is a, a sequence of mature mRNA that's already gone through processing. There's an area called a leader, which is not translated, and a trailer, which is also not translated. But then there's this area called the reading frame. That's what gets translated. The reading frame always starts with a codon, which in this case we see AUG. AUG is always the start codon for every amino acid chain. And then from there on, what we have are groups of three bases, again called codons, until we reach that stop codon at the end. So that's messenger RNA. It plays a very important role in bringing the genetic message out to the ribosomes for translation. Now speaking of ribosomes, that's our next important player. Ribosomes are made up of ribosomal RNA and protein. They join together to form two subunits. We have a large subunit and a small subunit, and they exist separately until the time translation begins. And when translation starts, they sort of fit together, and they form a 3D groove that you can see here, which sets up a mRNA binding site. And so this is where the mRNA molecule will actually fit right in here. Ribosomes have two major sites that are associated with them. They have what's called the P site, which is the site that holds the growing polypeptide chain. That's the site that's here on the left. And then the A site, which is the site for the attachment of the new transfer RNA that holds the next amino acid in the sequence. Now there is an additional site called the E site that we don't see on this picture, and that's thought to in some way be related to where the mRNA and the tRNAs exit when the process ends. Now our next player in the process of translation is referred to as transfer RNA, tRNA, and its important job is that it carries the amino acids to the ribosome. You can see here that there is at the three prime end of the tRNA molecule the amino acid attachment site, and at the other end down here at the bottom we have what is called an anticodon. Anticodons are three bases of mRNA that pair up with the mRNA codon, and in that way they provide the, the instructions essentially for laying down which amino acid gets placed into the chain at a certain time. Now there is a process called D tRNA charging that involves this enzyme that you see here. This enzyme works by picking up an amino acid from the cytoplasm and then combining it with adenosine triphosphate, ATP, and the tRNA molecule. And you can see that it's called amino acyl tRNA synthetase. Uh, this enzyme essentially has active sites where all the parts fit together. And then once the energy is provided by ATP, the amino acid is essentially bonded to the transfer RNA. Every transfer RNA has a specific amino acid that it carries. And speaking of amino acids, that's our last major player in the steps of translation. What we're going to look at here are the general structures of all amino acids. This is a review from organic chemistry. You'll remember that every amino acid has an amino group on one side and on the opposite end a carboxyl group. There is a central carbon atom and a hydrogen atom. And then what makes every amino acid different is their variable or R group. When two amino acids bond together, they're held together by what's called a peptide bond. And you should recall from uh, our organic chemistry section that the peptide bond forms when the process of dehydration synthesis occurs. And you can see here the molecule of water that is removed as that bonding occurs. So now that we know all the players, we're going to begin to look at the steps of translation. And just like replication and transcription, there are three steps, initiation, elongation, and termination. And in terms of the, the overall location within the cell where this occurs, you can see here the DNA exists inside the nucleus of the eukaryotic cell. Transcription and RNA processing also occur in the nucleus. And then the mature mRNA leaves the nucleus and becomes associated with the ribosome for translation to occur. Now I'm going to put on an animation of the steps that are involved in translation. We're going to take a look at this and then we'll come back and go through the individual steps and, and elucidate what each part is doing. Okay, so as this plays, just pay attention to it and then we'll come back and see how each individual step occurs. Bosomal subunit, formal methionyl tRNA and messenger RNA. The 50S ribosomal subunit then joins the complex. Proteins called initiation factors are also involved, but are not shown. The 70S ribosome has two sites to which transfer RNA-carrying amino acids can bind. One is called the peptidyl, or P site, and the other is called the acceptor, or A site. There is also a third site called the exit, or E site, where transfer RNAs are released. 
The initiating transfer RNA carrying formal methionine binds to the P site. A transfer RNA that recognizes the next codon and carries the second amino acid then moves into the A site. The formal methionine carried by the transfer RNA in the P site is then joined to the amino acid carried by the transfer RNA that just entered the A site by a peptide bond. The ribosome now advances a distance of one codon and the transfer RNA that carried the formal methionine is released at the E site. A transfer RNA carrying the next amino acid now moves into the A site where the anticodon on the transfer RNA matches the codon on the messenger RNA. The ribosome shifts down by a distance of one codon. As the shift occurs, the two amino acids on the transfer RNA in the P site are transferred to the new amino acid and the second transfer RNA is released from the E site. The ribosome continues to move along the messenger RNA and new amino acids are added to the growing polypeptide chain. Elongation of the polypeptide is terminated when a stop codon moves into the A site. A stop codon does not specify an amino acid and does not have a corresponding transfer RNA. The ribosome dissociates into the 30S and 50S subunits and the messenger RNA and protein are released. So that goes through the steps of translation. What we're going to do is break this down into three major steps, initiation, elongation, and termination. So step one is called initiation. And if you recall the 5 prime G cap, the guanosine triphosphate cap of the mRNA, which is produced during that step called processing, modification, uh, it will bind to the ribosome. Now when it binds to the ribosome in that three-dimensional groove, the two subunits of the ribosome become intact and we have our, our completed ribosome. And you can see here that the start codon, which is always AUG, and then its corresponding anticodon with methionine will bind in the P site. The A site, which is the attachment site for the next amino acid, is open and it's ready to receive new transfer RNA molecules. So the big idea of initiation is getting this ready for the process of elongating the amino acid chain, getting the start codon and its anticodon to match up, and having that A site ready in the ribosome. Now the next up is called elongation, and this is adding new amino acids. There are three major events during elongation, and you can see that they're underlined here in the text. I'm going to describe them. It's going to be important that you write down some notes to, to make sure that you understand what's happening in each of these. Okay, the first part of elongation is called codon recognition, and we can see this right here as this codon GUA and its anticodon CAU pair up. That's called codon recognition. Again, this is going to happen in the A site. It's going to be where there is an exposed codon and its anticodon and where they pair up, codon recognition. Now, the next part of elongation is peptide bond formation. This makes perfect sense if you look here at the top where the two amino acids come together. This is where the peptide bond forms. You can see that right here. It's pretty straightforward. Now, translocation is the last part of the elongation phase. And what happens during elongation during the translocation part of elongation is that the ribosome will move along the mRNA. The amino acid or the polypeptide chain is going to be transferred over to the older tRNA. The new tRNA molecule that comes in will enter at the A site and this allows for the continuous addition of new amino acids. So in essence what's occurring here is the shift of the tRNA from the A site to the P site as you can see right here and that enables the next round of codon recognition, peptide bond formation, and translocation to occur. So, a little bit complicated, but as you, I think if you watch this process in motion, it will make more sense to you. Now, the final step, as you probably remember, is called termination. And the big idea of termination is that there is a, st a stop codon that is reached. Stop codons do not code for any particular amino acid, but they do include release factor proteins, which signal the release of all parts. There are three unique stop codons. You have UAA, UAG, and UGA. They all code for the termination of protein synthesis. So those are the three steps. If we uh, put it all together, we get the central dogma, DNA to RNA to protein. This last step in 
in the central dogma is looking at how proteins are made. Once those proteins are produced at the ribosomes, they may need to be modified slightly, chemically changed a little bit. They can be packaged up at a Golgi apparatus and then sent off for their final destination. The last part of understanding the central dogma is going to look at what happens when the genetic code changes and that involves mutations. So that'll be screencast session number six that Mr. Workman will be bringing to you very soon. So until next time, see you in biology.